Well, it's great to uh, see everyone out to the meeting tonight. Um, thank you so much for coming. And if you're tuning in online as well, we give you a very warm welcome uh, to the gospel meeting. So we might make a start just by singing a few hymns, um, starting off with number 116. 116, that grand word, whosoever is ringing through my soul, whosoever will may come. In rivers of salvation, the living waters roll, whosoever will may come. Verse 2, whenever this glad message in God's own word I see, whosoever will may come, I know it is meant for sinners, I know it is meant for me, whosoever will may come. Let's just sing verses 1 and 2 of 116. That grand word whosoever is ringing through my soul.
let's just uh, open up with a word of prayer, please. Our Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence tonight just to give thanks for the message that we have to proclaim from your word. Father, we give thanks for the power of yet the simplicity of it, uh, that your Son, Christ Jesus, came into the world to save sinners. And Father, just help us tonight uh, in proclaiming this message. We just pray for real power and just pray for the audience here as well, those listening, that they would really just listen to this message to be sensitive to it and to respond to it uh, while there is time. Father, we just pray for a help in the meeting and give thanks for our Saviour in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'd just like to read one verse uh, at the outset of the meeting tonight, and that's found in the New Testament in the book of Romans. And it's found in chapter 6, and it's verse 23. And this was actually the verse that my wife Sarah read uh, when she trusted the Lord as her Savior. So it's a very special verse uh, to her, and I just pray that tonight it would be a very special verse to you. Uh, that it would really speak to you in the meeting tonight. So let's just read it together a couple of times in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. And the words say, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me just read that once more again, just so we all uh, just get that verse in our minds and in our hearts. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now we're gonna come back to this verse in a little bit tonight. And I see there's all age groups here. So I'm just trusting that this message would be uh, simple, that you'd be able to understand it and that you'd be able to respond to it while there is time. So let's just, uh, let's go back to the first book in the Bible, just uh, in Genesis and chapter one. I'm going to come back to our verse in Romans in a bit, but let's just go back to the beginning and just to see what the first verse in the Bible uh, reads. And it reads, in the beginning, God. And God was very intentional in making the first words of our Bible, the first four words, in the beginning, God. You know, from the outset, the Bible, it states the existence of God, and that might seem like a very simple thing to you tonight, but it's something that's really important, and that is to acknowledge the existence of God. And uh, while I was in primary school, a lot of you here are still probably in primary school or junior school, uh, there was this kid in my class, and I wasn't a Christian at that time, but no matter uh, the day, every single day really, he would like to taunt me in front of his friends and he would just question the very existence of God. He knew I was from a Christian home and he played in my football team. And a bit later on, when I moved uh, to another place in Australia and I started high school, I learned that this uh, young man, tragically, he was killed in a car accident. And I don't know whether he ever responded to the message that I'm going to preach to you tonight from God's word, but he was one that questioned the very existence of God. When we go to Psalms in uh, chapter 14, we see that it reads that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And so we pray that you would not do the foolish thing tonight of questioning the very existence of God. You know, when we read through Genesis chapter one, it doesn't take very long until you see the absolute authority and power of God. And I, uh, I quickly tallied up. There was about eight times that you can read in the first chapter where God says, he simply just says and brings things into existence. He's a pretty powerful and amazing God. And he pronounced all his creation as good in verse 25 of this first chapter. But there was still something missing to his creation. He created the heavens, the earth. He created all that was within the earth, but there was still something that was missing. And that was the crown to his creation. In verse 26, it reads, his image, um, he wanted to create man in his image and according to his likeness. And so he did. He breathed in the very breath of life into the first man on earth, and that is Adam. That's an incredible story. And so he brought human humanity uh, into existence just from the very breath, his own breath. 
you know, humanity, we are unique among all of God's creation. We not only have a material body, which is skin and bone, but we also have an immaterial soul and spirit within. And, you know, man was designed with the intention of having fellowship and communion with God. You know, Adam, he was in the garden there and God walked and talked with him in the cool of the day. That was his intention, to be close to man, to have a relationship uh, with man. And tonight, God wants to have a relationship with you. But something happened uh, at the outset of creation here in the garden, and it's known as the fall. You know, God placed Adam in that garden. He didn't want Adam to be alone, and so he created Eve. And Eve was going to be a helpmeet for Adam. And he gave them everything that they needed in this garden. It was a beautiful place. It was good. It was perfect. And there was this tree that was in the garden called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But God gave a commandment to Adam and he said, don't eat of that tree. He said that if you eat of that tree, you will surely die. And that's found in the next chapter of Genesis. When we get to Genesis chapter 3, it introduces us to another being, and that is Satan himself. He's known as the serpent. He's the cunning one. You know, Satan actually used to be uh, an angel of God up there in heaven, but due to his rebellion, uh, God cast him out of his presence, and he's known as a fallen angel. And so Satan, in his cunningness, he came to to Eve, and uh, he, he started to question God's commandment to her or to Adam. He said, has God really said? And he questioned God and he made Eve question God too. And so she actually ate of the fruit. She gave some to Adam as well. And in that moment, everything changed. And that's known as the fall. That was when man disobeyed God. You know, disobeying God, we call that a three-letter word, and most of you here know what that is, and that's sin. Sin is that which is contrary or opposite to God's perfection and holiness. And because of Adam's sin, because of Eve's sin as well, God, he placed a curse on the world, on the people, the animals, the plants. After the fall, God drove, he got Adam and Eve, and he drove them out of the, the garden. He put two children there with flaming swords to guard the entrance. They had to find their own food, their own shelter. Adam had to till from the ground. He had to start farming to get food. And Eve had the curse of suffering in childbirth. You know, this fall of man through Adam's disobedience, it's passed on to every one of us. In Romans 3 and 23, it says, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's perfect standard. Sin really is a broken state for mankind and has passed upon all of us. We all have sin. And because of that, it breaks that relationship that God intended for you and I to be perfect in harmony with him. But it also brought about death, as we read. You know, sin brings forth death. And God warned Adam. He warned Eve and he said, when you eat of that fruit, when you disobey me, you will surely die. They probably had no concept of what death was. Up until that point, there was no such thing as death. Romans 6 and 23, again, I'll read, the penalty or the wages of sin is death. And Romans 5 and 12, as sin entered the world through one man, that was Adam, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people, including me, including you tonight, because all have sinned. And, you know, death, it doesn't just affect us physically. Yes, one day we'll die. But there's a death here that it's speaking of, and it's spiritual death. And that really is that disconnect, that separation from you and I to a righteous and a holy God. So one day, yes, we're going to physically die, but if we don't have our sins dealt with, if we haven't trusted Christ, there's going to be a separation spiritually for all of eternity between us and God. Hebrews 9 and 27 it is appointed for men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And that's a pretty scary thing. And for my, this guy at school who used to taunt me about the existence of God, it's a scary thing to think that right now in eternity, he likely sees God as his judge. 
You know, it's up until this point we've read, it's a pretty grim story. And uh, if I was to stop there, there'd be no hope for any of us. But that is where the good news comes in. And that's where God's remedy, excuse me, God's remedy comes in. We've all sinned. We all deserve this eternal separation from God. But then in Mark, it says, it, well, in Mark, it actually talks about this place of separation. It's a tragic place. It says where the fire never goes out, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is known as the lake of fire. And it's our prayer that no one here ends up in that place. And so we've talked a bit about sin. We've talked about death. But this is where the good news comes in. And this is where we read that while we were still powerless and without strength at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. You know our message tonight, it's about a person, God's own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's about him coming to this earth and providing a remedy for us. Stuart Townend in his song, In Christ Alone, they are beautiful words. It says, in Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. So let's just talk a little bit about the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. Who does it say the Lord Jesus Christ really is? You know, in, the, the, uh, in John, we can read John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word sorry and the word was with God and the word was God and this word that it speaks of is the Lord Jesus Christ himself John 1 and 14 tells us the word Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us so maybe you're asking why did the Lord Jesus Christ come to this earth why did God's very son there in heaven come to this earth and take on humanity let me read a verse, one of my favourite verses from Hebrews 2 and 9. Being made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour that he, the Lord Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. You know, we read earlier that sin, when it entered the world through Adam, one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people. We've just read here of the Lord Jesus Christ coming to earth to taste death for every man in our place. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, the reason he came to earth was to take our place as our sacrifice, to go to that place and to suffer and there to die so that we don't need to. Just over 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ, he came to this place. And just recently, I flew over to Australia with my wife. It was about 16,000 kilometres, but much less than that in the place just out Jerusalem outside Jerusalem, the Lord Jesus Christ there, he hung. And they put big spikes through his, his hands and his feet. And he not only suffered there, but he died. And he died there because of your sin and because of mine. In Isaiah 53, he, that is God the Father, shall see the travail of his soul, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, and he shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant, Jesus Christ, justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. I love that verse. That just tells me that God there, he was satisfied when he saw the Lord Jesus Christ suffering there because of the iniquities of, of me and of you. And because the Lord Jesus Christ, because he already took that penalty for our sin there upon the cross, we don't need to. You know, God, he remains fair and just in freeing us from our sin because he's seen that his son has taken the penalty for us. And that's where the gift of salvation comes in tonight. I was in my prayer talking about a response that needs to be made by each one of us. You know, it's a gift. Romans 6 and 23, that verse that we read tonight, it says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. A gift is something that we need to take. We don't automatically get given a gift. It's something that we have to receive for ourselves. And this gift, while it's free and offered to each one of us, it came at a great cost. In Australia, uh, on April the 25th, we were actually there for this date. It's known as Anzac Day, and that stands for Australia New Zealand Army Corporation. And it's a day where we remember the great cost of the soldiers who served 
uh, in different wars in Gallipoli and other wars since then that bought the freedom of that we enjoy in Australia. And I'm sure there's a day here too where we remember the cost of the soldiers who served for our freedom. But tonight there was a greater cost than any of this, and that was the cost of God's own son for you. And it's something that we need to respond to. God won't twist our arm. He won't push salvation onto us. It's something we need to receive and take for our own. God's given you and I a free will, and he wants us to use it to exercise our choice and to take him as our saviour. You know, and not only did the Lord Jesus Christ die, but he rose again. It tells us in 1 Peter, he has gone into heaven and sits at the right hand of God. That's incredible. Tonight we preach a person who is risen. We don't preach someone who was uh, a loser and that was not victorious over sin, death and hell. We preach a victor, someone who's risen and is alive and he's at the right hand of God tonight and he wants you and I to respond to him. You know, Robert Larry in his hymn, he wrote, death cannot keep his prey. Jesus, my saviour, he tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord. The Lord Jesus was victorious over sin. The fact that he's alive, that proves that we no longer have to be under sin and death. And so this offer is offered to you uh, tonight. We pray that you would just take it. In 2 Corinthians, it says, behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the time that you need to accept this offer from God. You know, God is long-suffering, but there's going to come a day when he's going to return. And if you haven't chosen his son as your saviour by then, there could be a day when you see God as your judge. But we pray tonight that you'd see him uh, as your saviour. And so we just would really pray as that now comes up and presents uh, the gospel message again to you. We just pray that you would be uh, sensitive to this message. Realise your need as a sinner and trust him before it is too late. Now, it's nice to see everyone who's here tonight and those who are tuned in on Zoom, we give you a warm welcome as well. And it's a privilege to share the gospel meeting tonight. I'm actually just pinch hitting our son Paul was supposed to be speaking tonight, and uh, he's not well, so I'm a last-minute replacement for Paul. But it's a privilege to be here to speak with my son-in-law, or our son-in-law, which was my son-in-law. Um, the second greatest gift that Tom ever received, the greatest was eternal life. Uh, but the second greatest gift he ever received was our daughter, Sarah, in marriage. So it's a privilege to be able to share in the gospel with Tom tonight. Tom and Sarah just got back from Australia from visiting his mom and dad, and it's nice to have him here. I'll ask you to read, please, in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, and we're going to read from verse 11. Revelation 20 and verse 11. says, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, or great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now I know that very often people don't like to hear bad news. And uh, I'm kind of one of those people myself. I don't particularly enjoy hearing bad news. But should we tell people bad news if it's true? Someone is going to the doctor and the doctor uh, does all the tests and all the diagnostics and then uh, she discovers what is wrong. Should she tell the patient the truth? 
What kind of a doctor would you think it would be that after doing all of the tests and analyzing the results and having absolutely no doubt in her mind what the diagnosis was, would look at the patient and not tell them the truth. Tell them, oh, you're fine, everything's okay. You'd say, well, that would be terrible. That would be unprofessional. That wouldn't be loving. That would be irresponsible. Well, maybe there's times when doctors might do that if there's no hope. Sometimes there's an accident victim and the doctors know that a person's not gonna make it and they, they don't really hold out any hope for them. And they think it's merciful to not tell them the truth. But to, think of this, if there was an absolute cure, Let's say there was somebody with internal bleeding after an accident and without medical intervention, they only had hours to live. But medical intervention was possible. It was almost certain that they could go in, have emergency surgery, fix what's wrong, and the person would be saved. Should a doctor tell the person the truth? I think any reasonable individual would say, yes, absolutely tell them the truth. Well, you know, when we preach the gospel from the word of God, we are accountable to God for telling the truth. And the truth of the gospel is that we need to be saved. It's not just that it would be good to be saved. It's not just that things would be so much better if we were saved. Oh, that's true. But the message of the Bible is that we need to be saved. Because if we are not saved, from our sins, if we do not receive this gift of eternal life, then the truth is that we will perish, that we'll be held accountable, that we will be judged. That is the truth of the Bible. And so I would like tonight to speak very faithfully, but very compassionately about this description we're given in the third last chapter of our Bibles concerning a day of judgment. This is very personal to me. My parents lived in Northern Ireland. My dad's gone now, my mom is still there. I only lived in Northern Ireland for two years of my life. One, when I was between one year old and two year old, and I don't remember very much about that. That was the year of 1965, the end of 65 into 66. But the other year that I lived in Northern Ireland was in 1972. 1972, I was eight years old. And in Northern Ireland, they don't very often get hot weather like we have today, this beautiful sunny day. I actually had this in my mind today as I was feeling for the first time in 2022, that nice, hot, sticky feeling of a nice, warm summer day. Hardly ever get that in Ireland. Ming shaking his head like it's nothing nice about it. It's everything nice about it. I don't think God ever meant us to live in winter. But in Northern Ireland that summer, there was a heat wave. And it was during that heat wave, sitting in a gospel meeting in a little building called Ballyclare Gospel Hall at eight years old, that I first remember being anxious about being saved. I'd always known I needed to be saved. Like some of you kids here, I grew up knowing Bible verses. I went to Sunday school. I could answer questions. I knew I needed to be saved, but it never really struck home to me in a personal sense with urgency that I needed to be saved until that Sunday night. And I was sitting in this gospel hall and it was stifling hot, very unusual for Ireland. And my dad was preaching and he was preaching from this passage. And as he read this verse, I saw the dead small and great stand before God. It just struck me that night. And what those words mean to you small and great, I don't know. What they hit me with that night was, that even though I was just a child, even though I was just eight years old, I knew that I was a sinner and I knew I needed to be saved. And when I heard my father read the dead small and great would stand before God, it just struck like an arrow to my soul. Andrew, you're just a little boy. But if you don't get saved, you will be standing all alone before this huge throne and God on the throne, your mom and dad won't be with you. Your brother and sister won't be with you. None of your friends will be with you. And as a little boy not saved, you'll be standing alone before God and it'll be too late. I didn't get saved that night. 
And in fact, the year went through 1972. In February of 1973, my family came to Canada. And about six weeks later, my mom and dad went on down to Trinidad and my sister Eleanor and I stayed here in Toronto. Lived with my aunt and uncle and we uh, grew up with them and went to school. In October of 1974, at which point I was now 10 years old. There was a series of gospel meetings in Brackendale Gospel Hall by Mr. Malcolm Radcliffe and Mr. Jack Noble. During that series of gospel meetings, my sister Eleanor got saved. And Eleanor was a year and a half old, and still is a year and a half old. Funny how that works, isn't it? She was a year and a half ahead of me. Eleanor got saved. And I was anxious to be saved. Every night, go to gospel meeting. And I was trying very hard to get saved. One night, Mr. Jack Noble stood up in his half of the meeting, the second half of the meeting. He said, we'll read from Revelation chapter 20. And as he read these verses, it's as though those intervening, what, 18 months or so just slipped away. And once again, I was sitting. There wasn't imagination, really. It was the spirit of God dealing with my soul, understanding that as a little boy, small, wasn't a great sinner, wasn't a criminal. I hadn't lived most of my life, but I was a 10-year-old sinner, not saved. And I understood the dead, small and great would stand before God. I did get saved the next day after that, October the 15th, 1974. God saved my soul. So I'd like to speak to you a little bit tonight, whoever you are, whatever age you are, about this scene that John is given. It's not a vision in the sense that it's just a fairy tale. It's part of a vision that John was given of things which must be hereafter. So John got a preview given to him to record in Scripture so that the truth of it would come to us, would come to you in time. And John is allowed to see something that absolutely will occur. So I want you to think with me about this throne. It's called the Great White Throne in verse 11. John saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. So just have established in your mind that the whole universe as we know it has begun to just be swept aside and a throne is established and there's a man sitting on the throne and there's people who are called before that throne. And there's books brought, and there's judgment being rendered. That's the vision that John describes for us. So think with me, first of all, about the sovereign on the throne. That's the first thing that the Spirit of God draws our attention to through John. I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it. So the first thing John wants us to focus on here is the sovereign who's sitting on the throne. Who is he? Well, this last book of our Bible is entirely taken up. Sometimes people say it's, it's taken up with telling us about future events. It does describe coming events. But its principal purpose is not so much telling us what is going to happen. Its principal purpose is found in the first verse of the first chapter. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the one who is sitting on this throne is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is the one into whose hand all authority has been given. And he is the one to whom the Father has given all judgment. So he is the one sitting on the throne. But listen to how he's described. John says, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. You know, if you're familiar with the message of the gospel, you have heard a lot about the Lord Jesus Christ as a silent sufferer, passively in Calvary, one who hung silently on a cross, one who didn't defend himself, one who didn't lash out, one who didn't revile again when people were reviling him. And you're used to thinking of Jesus Christ that way, as a gentle, loving Savior, and he is that. And you have heard about the Lord Jesus Christ as a seeking Savior. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, Patiently, for some of you, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, you've heard about a Savior who loves you and has died on a cross so you can be saved. 
and is pleading with you patiently, longing to save your soul. That is the Savior of the Bible. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know, there's sometimes that people think because that's who he is, he could never, he could never banish his own creatures to a lake of fire. He could never eternally punish people that he loved. You know, that's a lie from the devil. Because the truth is what we've read in the Bible. That if you won't accept him as your savior, that if you won't accept him and the salvation that he provides as a free gift, he will have no choice but to judge you for your sin. And that's what we've read. This one sitting on the throne is one from whom everyone will seek to flee, to run, to hide. And they won't be able to. Be a terrible thing, a terrible thing. For someone familiar with the gospel message to stand one day before a throne, to look into the face of the one that could have been their savior and longed to be their savior and is now the judge. But that's the sovereign who's sitting on the throne. But think with me secondly about the subjects before the throne. Because in the very next verse, John goes on to describe, I saw the dead, great and small, Standing before the throne. There's a lot of things in life that people like to avoid. I like to avoid the dentist. COVID was a great time for me. Never saw a dentist for over two years. And they stopped calling me. I actually found a new dentist after it was over. I was kind of ashamed to go back to the old one. There are a lot of things in life you can avoid. You know, sometimes people get a speeding ticket. I'm not sure what that would feel like, but no, I, I, I have had a couple. But, you know, you get a court date, and maybe you'd like to avoid it. I know in, uh, in the workplace, there's very awkward situations that people often would like to avoid. I remember as a child uh, being disciplined and uh, having a great desire to avoid it. I remember as a parent wishing I could avoid some of those sorts of meetings with my own children. I think of a husband sometimes, as a husband sometimes, avoiding, you know, answering my wife when she asked me what I weighed this morning. There's a lot of things in life you might like to avoid. But, you know, these people who are standing before the throne, they're irresistibly drawn to this throne. They can't avoid it. Tom was telling us tragically about a, a boy, just a boy in school claiming but there's no God. You know, there will be people drawn to this throne who are going to stand and they'll be irresistibly brought there to stand before a God that they claimed didn't exist. And it'll make no difference whether they believed in him or didn't believe in him. Everyone's going to be called and everyone's going to stand. They're going to be irresistibly drawn to stand before the throne. But, you know, I'm not so much concerned tonight for you to think and fill your mind with all the different types of people, Hitlers of history, the awful criminals that you read about or, or watch the news about, um, leaders of nations that commit atrocious things. All these people, there's a sense maybe that you think, well, good, there will be justice. They'll be called. Yes, they will. They will. You know what I'd like you to think about tonight? That if your name is not written in the book of life, if you are not saved, if you have not received the gift of eternal life, you will be drawn. And you will be there to stand before the throne of the judge. You know, the second thing I notice about these people is that they're individually judged. We read down when you come to verse uh, 14, uh, verse 13, they were judged each one of them according to what they had done. They were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. It's not going to be this great mob scene, this great throng. They were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Be quite a thing to stand all alone and to face God. And to have to answer for what you did with his son. 
But you know, the third thing I have noticed about these people is they're silent. You don't read anything in here of any of them saying anything. And in fact, the Bible makes it clear that Romans chapter 3, verse 19 says, Every mouth may be stopped, and all the world stand guilty before God. You know, people sometimes have so many arguments. Yes, but, you know, yes, I, I hear what you're saying, but if you knew some of the things that I know of, some of the things Christians have done, you would understand why I feel the way I do. Really? Please, in God's name, please don't allow the failure of Christians to play a part in condemning your soul to eternal judgment. This is between you and God. This is your soul and the God of heaven. This is your soul and your savior or your judge. And when people get to this point and stand before the throne, they have nothing to say. But thirdly, I'd like to just speak a little bit about the scrolls that are on the throne. Because John describes to us that the books were opened. And then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. So in this scene that John is describing for us, on the throne, that the sovereign is sitting on the throne, the subjects are out in front of the throne, but then scrolls. They didn't have books like this or electronic books. It would have been a scroll rolled out. And so these scrolls are brought to the throne. What are the books? Well, I'd suggest to you the first book that we know will be there is the record of Scripture. The truth of the Bible. It'll be there. The Lord Jesus said that. He said the Word of God lives and abides forever. After every other book is long gone into human history, this book, God's revelation will stand. The Lord Jesus also said regarding the Bible, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. He said, Heaven and earth will pass away. My words shall not pass away. In what way will the Bible judge the people who are standing at this throne? Well, if I could just speak very kindly to you tonight, whoever you might be listening, the words of this book have brought you the message of the gospel. The words of this book have explained clearly and faithfully to you your sinfulness and your accountability to God because of your sin. The words of this book have told you that God is a God of love and God is a God of salvation. And the words of this book have told you plainly how Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The words of this book, through the message of the gospel, have offered you, in some cases for some of you, over and over and over and over again, have offered you salvation. The words of this book have warned you, as they're doing tonight, that if you do not accept God's gift of salvation, you will perish. Because you're accountable for your sins. This book will be at the throne. And it will be proven to be true. But you know, there's another book that will be at the throne. And that is the record of sin. It says that the dead were judged each one according to their works. Every sin that you've ever committed. Things that you've thought about that nobody else knows. God knows. Things that maybe you did years ago that you've long forgotten, God's recorded and he hasn't forgotten. Johnny Cash sang a song in his gospel album about the old account. There was a time on earth when in the books of heaven an old account was standing with sins yet unforgiven. My name was at the top and there were many things below. But I went up to the keeper and settled long ago. The old account was large and larger every day because I was always sinning and I never stopped to pray. But when I looked to him, and saw such pain and woe, I know I had it settled and settled long ago. What about you? There's a record of your sin. Not a record that your mom or your dad are keeping. Not a record that any preacher or priest is keeping. Not even a record that you're keeping, a record that God is keeping. And every sin recorded to your account, it's going to end one of two ways. 
Either that account is going to be completely cleared by receiving the gift of eternal life. What a tremendous joy. I'm standing before you tonight to tell you I have sinned, not just in my past, tragically still. I still have sin within. But you know, I don't have an account anymore in heaven with all my sin. It's gone. That doesn't mean that I can live however I like. But it does mean that God has taken my sin, not just its penalty, but the sin itself with all of its guilt and all of its stain and all of its defilement and all of the wretchedness that comes with sin. He's taken it all. And he's laid it on his son. And because Jesus Christ bore my sins in his own body on the tree, my account's clear. That's one way it'll end for you. The other way it'll end is that you'll stand before a throne. And on that throne will be several scrolls. And on one of those scrolls will be your record of sin. And you'll face it. You know, there's another scroll before the throne. John says, I saw another book. And this book was the book of life. The Lamb's Book of Life. This book records the name of every person who has received the gift of eternal life. And every person whose name is written in that book, they don't have a listing in the record of sin. So in this picture John describes, your name is either written down with every sin you've ever committed, crying out for God's judgment, or your name is written in a different book, in the book of life, and there's no mention of sin. Which is it? I plead with you tonight in God's name, face that question now. Which is it? If your name is written in the book of life, you have nothing to fear. If your name is not written in the book of life, you have every reason to tremble in the seat you're sitting in. Be a fearful, fearful thing to stand before the throne and to face the judge with all of your unforgiven sin. It's a wonderful thing to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But think with me fourthly about the sentence that comes from the throne. You know, there's something about this throne which does speak of justice. Everyone will receive according to what they have done. Sometimes in the gospel we say there's no difference. And I, I have said it, the Bible says it, it's true. In one sense, there is no difference. I do worry sometimes that I've thought about things I've said from the platform, but afterwards I've thought, you know, maybe that was slightly misrepresented. For someone to, to, to think there's no difference between a person who's a, a, a serial killer, a murderer, and someone who has told a lie. Well, there's no difference in this respect. But they both stand guilty before God. But there is a difference in terms of justice. And that the person who has committed those particularly heinous acts will have to answer according to their works. They will answer specifically for what they did. But I would plead with you tonight. Don't worry about that. Because the fact is. You will answer for what you did. So there is a difference. If you don't get saved. There is a difference. In what people face. At the throne. In terms of this record of sin. But you know where there is no difference. Is in the sentence that comes from the throne. When we come to the last verse of this passage. It simply says this. Those whose names were not in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. There's no second chance. There's no pleading for a reduced sentence. I say that reverently. There's no distinguishing. There's no salvation from this throne. There's salvation tonight, but there's no salvation at this throne. There is a singular sentence that comes. Those whose names are not in the book of life 
were cast into the lake of fire. Now, I started out by saying that it's not easy to tell people the truth. It'd be far easier for me to, to just tell you something tonight that makes you feel good. But I do feel burdened before the Lord to tell you the truth. Why? Remember the story I told there about the person needing emergency surgery, internal bleeding, and if they didn't get it, they were going to perish. But the intervention was right there, ready for them in their life to be saved. Well, that's where we are in the gospel meeting. There's not one person listening to me tonight who has to stand before this throne. There's no one listening to the message of the gospel for whom this is an inevitability. It actually rests with you tonight. Because the Savior is still pleading. He doesn't want to judge you for your sins. The Bible makes that crystal clear. He did not come to condemn the world. He came so that the world through him might be saved. And he has no desire to hold you accountable for your sin. Because he has already died on a cross so that your sin can be put away. And so tonight as you listen, there is salvation. There is forgiveness. There is peace. There is confidence. I remember, I've described to you those two occasions, once when I was eight, once when I was 10, when this description made me shake inside, filled me with fear. I didn't want to ever have to stand before the throne. And I would tremble because I wanted to be saved. You know, this description doesn't fill me with fear anymore. It hasn't for years. Why? Because somehow I'm better? No, I'm no better. Because I have the peace in my soul of knowing that because the Lord Jesus Christ is my Savior, I have eternal life. And the same God that always tells the truth provides me assurance that I will never stand before a throne of judgment. Because there's somebody else that took it for me. You know, that's what happened at the cross. I want to describe it carefully, reverently. What happened before I was even born is that the Son of God looked on me and he loved me. And in the words of the hymn, he took my sins and my sorrows and he made them his very own and he bore my burden to Calvary and he suffered and he died alone. He bore my sins in his own body on the tree. And he went out to answer to God as if he was me. And because he bore my sins and tells me all about it, I can believe him, but I'm not going to have to pay for them. God's not going to call me now to account for my sins when he's already punished his son. You'll say, well, what does it mean to believe in him? Well, is what, is what I have just said the truth or is it not? one or the other. It's either true or it's not true. It's either believing what God says or believing not what God says. And he holds you tonight accountable for your response. So I would urge you tonight as we close the meeting, accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. There is an offer of life and peace and joy and forgiveness. Never to have to worry about facing your sin. But there is a note of warning that if you continue on without Christ, you are on a path that is inevitably going to take you to a throne of judgment. Let's pray. Father, we do thank thee tonight for the message of the gospel. We thank thee that there is life and hope and peace. But Father, we confess to thee that the solemnity and the weight of these eternal issues lie very heavy on our hearts. We know that the devil blinds the minds of those who don't believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, would shine into them. We know that even now, as we've reached the end of our meeting, he's doing his very best to blind the minds of those that don't know thy son. So we would just cry to thee in prayer that through thy spirit, his purposes would be defeated. We pray for those here in the hall who don't know Christ, those that perhaps are uh, watching on Zoom or YouTube, and for them personally, they don't have a Savior. And Father, we pray that all such tonight would understand the reality of where they are and what lies ahead, and that they would turn to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation 
and receive eternal life. We ask this in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. We'll sing just two verses of number 33. Number 33. We'll sing verse 2 and 3. It says, Eternity, O dreadful thought, for thee a child of Adam's race. If thou shouldst in thy sins be brought to stand before the awful face from which the heaven and earth shall flee, the throne one of eternity. Verse 3 says, Eternity, but Jesus died. Yes, Jesus died on Calvary. Behold him, thorn crowned, crucified, the spotless one made sin for thee. O sinner, haste, for refuge flee, he saves, and for eternity. We'll just sing verse 2 and 3 of number 33. Eternity, O oh dread.